Now we want to review the argument that was put forward by James Madison in Federalist Number 10, one of the most famous of the 85 uh, pamphlets that were put together that became the Federalist Papers. And so the Federalist Papers, as we had argued previously when we talked about the Constitution, um, was a meant to be a form of political propaganda. It was to advocate a particular position. It was to say that the U.S. Constitution needed to be ratified because the Articles of Confederation were too weak, that there needed to be a stronger national government, all of these things. But at the same time, there are certain parts of the Federalist Papers that can and should be seen as an important statement of American political philosophy. And that's exactly what Federalist Number 10 is. And that's why I had you read it, and I would ask you to read it again if you so, because I think the argument in and of itself is worth thinking about. And in Federalist Number 10, he, James Madison is, is pointing out the idea that there are going to be, in a society that they're creating, is going to be factions. The terminology that they use are factions. Those are a synonymous with interest groups. And so when James Madison talks about factions, he's talking about interest groups. And what he says in the definition is that a faction, he says, by a faction I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest, adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. And so that's a fairly long statement, a fairly long definition, but in doing so we can see some... So based on this definition, would we say that factions are good or bad? And what we're going to argue at the end is that it's like most social science, it's actually both. The itself of factions sounds pretty negative. When you take a look at the phrasing that's used, the idea that of, of passion, the idea of passion is something that was scary to the framers. They, when they think of passion, think of think of a bunch of drunk farmers with pitchforks who are roused to take up arms against judges, burn down courthouses, to listen to Daniel Shades, to say we're not going to pay our taxes anymore. Those are factions. That's passion, and passion is not something that that the framers thought was going should be part of a well working democratic republic. But at the same time, it's going to happen. It's inevitable because of human nature. The pulse of passion that creates and motivates and actuates interest groups is an indication that the framers were not big fans of factions. The other one is, in the definition, we can see it's not a neutral definition. There is power to the definition because it actually indicates that we should expect a problem. And that is the argument that these things are adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. So in saying that, it's adverse to, it's against, against things that we like, it's against the rights of other citizens or to the permanent aggregate interests of the community. And what they're arguing is, is that interest groups want what they want. They band together because they want something. They want to have gun rights and it does not matter how many people die in school shootings or they may be people who really, really love kitty cats and that they were that in their community it is a no-kill shelter so that every single kitty cat that is on in the beach are, are meant to live and to thrive. Whatever that interest is, that's what they want and they won't take no for an answer. They want the answer that they want. They are not willing to compromise. And so their real concerns are because they're caused by passion, which makes it hard to compromise. And what people want, they want even if it has a negative impact of other individuals, if it infringes on the individual liberties of other groups, as well as potentially being a negative for the entire aggregate community. So in that sense, factions are not a good thing at all. There's something to be worried about. But if you take a step back, and that's what he does in Federalist Number 10, is to say there's a real problem here because factions, interest groups, come from a very positive place. The reason why we have them is because we have these important individual liberties, because we have freedom of speech, because we have freedom of petition, because we have freedom of assembly. We have those First Amendment rights that then give interest groups the power to do something with them. And the things that they do can be bad, but the reasons why they're able to do it is really good. We like those liberties. That's why it's put in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Interest groups are good and bad simultaneously. They're good because they are the expression of these fundamental individual liberties.
freedom of speech, freedom of, the, of petition, freedom of assembly. All of those are part of interest groups. The bad thing is, is that those groups, when they get together and they have their power to petition, they have their power to say what they want, they have the power to group with whomever they want, all of those things allows them to have their passion boil up and that they will continue to fight for what they want, even if it hurts other people, even if it hurts the community. And so what you have is a problem that cannot be eliminated. All you can do, according to James Madison, is you can limit the effects, the negative effects, because you cannot get rid of the causes of faction, because the causes of faction are a good thing. The causes of faction is political liberty, and you can't get rid of those. So all you can do is mitigate the effects, and that's what he says. And so he says the goal is, is that we need to come up with a way to limit the mischief of factions, that's the terminology that he uses, consequences of these groups being able to use these important liberties to express their, their views and their displeasure. And so the solution is not to get rid of liberty, because that is a terrible society. Instead, we know that interest groups are going to exist and are going to thrive, but what we need to do is to limit the negative effects of those things. And this, going back to the definition, is you have to go back and recognize when he says whether amounting to a majority or a minority, because there's a recognition that, that interest groups, that factions, can either be a majority or a minority. And if they are a majority, then you might have solutions than if it is a minority. And so there are two types of factions, each of which might need to have a different solution. And so is one that we've already experienced. We know what a majority faction is. It's the idea of tyranny of the majority, mob rule, the concern that the framers had about democracy. And so what they said was, we do have ways to stop these majority factions. When factions become a majority of the whole, we have a way to limit their effects. And the ways in which we limit their effects is the separation of powers, checks and balances, federalism, all that good stuff we talked about in chapter two, the foundation of the, the rules of the game, make it so that there are ways in which the majority may want something. They may be able to convince the House of Representatives, for example, to do something crazy. But then the U.S. Senate might turn around and say, no, that's too crazy, we're not going to do it. And even if, you, even if these groups can gather together, this majority attitudes can come together and get the House and the Senate, then the president could veto that legislation. And even if you get the House, the Senate, and the president to agree to something, if what they agree to violates the Constitution in some way, the Bill of Rights, for example, then the U.S. Supreme Court can rule that action unconstitutional. And maybe the federal government is taken over by this passion, this impulse of passion, then federalism could come in and certain states could try to change that. So in many ways, majority factions are solved by the things we've already seen. Those, if the faction, the group who is imbued with passion and trying to get what they want is a majority of the population, then we have protections against that. That's called the separation of powers, checks and balances, federalism. But if you have a group that's not made up of a majority, if the faction is a minority, is less than a majority, then how do you deal with that? And according to the framers, the way in which you deal with that is to have majority rule. And so we do have ways in which majority rule is the decision rule. Procedural democracy, as we talked about with the ideas from the first chapter about the ideas of democracy. We do have majority rule. So how does legislation get passed? It gets passed because a majority of the House and a majority of the Senate say it's going to. And how are decisions made on the U.S. Supreme Court? It's a majority of the U.S. Supreme Court that makes a ruling. How is the president chosen? It is a majority of the Electoral College who chooses the president of the United States. So in many ways, you see majority rule that exists in our political system. And so according to James Madison, majority rule is going to stop minorities. But the issue is, is that because you have this system of separation of powers and checks and balances and federalism, what you've done is you've created a mechanism whereby interest groups can continue to fight. They don't have to take no for an answer. So if they are unsuccessful in convincing the House 
and the Senate to pass legislation. They'll go to the executive branch and try to lobby the Department of Agriculture, the uh, Department of Education. They could go and try to influence the ways in which laws are actually implemented to get an outcome that's favorable to them and their groups. If they're not successful there, they could then have lawsuits that they will fund to be able to take this to the U.S. Supreme Court and perhaps argue that this law is unconstitutional. And if they're not successful at the national level, they could do it at the state levels. They could try to convince large states like California and Pennsylvania and New York, and if they get enough of them to change it, it could change the direction of policy in important ways. And so because the system that was put into place to deal with the majority factions and the undue influence of tyranny of the majority, it's actually empowered interest groups in such a way that some people argue that the mischiefs of factions haven't been controlled, that we don't have enough majority rule. If majority rule is in fact the way in which you stop minority government, by adding in separation of powers, checks and balances, and federalism, it then creates power for them. especially if you think about it. There are only certain types of interest groups that will be able to afford all the things that are necessary to be able to lobby Congress, to be able to go and lobby the executive branch, to be able to fund lawsuits in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, to go to individual states and try to get them to change their policies. There are only some groups that can afford to do that and other groups. So in doing this and trying to be clever, they might have been too clever and made it difficult so that now interest groups do have too much authority.